Welcome to the breakthrough story. The purpose of the breakthrough story is to look behind the scenes of successful individuals in Columbus, Ohio to see what challenges and breakthroughs they experienced along their path to success. What obstacles did they face in their early stages of life and what helped them break through those obstacles? What has helped them succeed and what is something they did differently? These are some of the few questions we try to answer with the breakthrough story. This episode is brought to you by Orange Visuals. Orange Visuals is a one-stop shop listing and branding service for real estate professionals in Central Ohio. When you need to market yourself or a property, Orange Visuals provides all the services such as photo, video, brochures, single property websites, and so much more. Visit Orange Visuals today and see why top producing realtors choose to market themselves with Orange Visuals. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Breakthrough Series. And today we have a very special episode. Um, I already know that we're going to get a lot of value out of this uh, because we're joined with John Harp. And John Harp is a real estate consultant and coach um, who coaches and helps agents from the very beginning get to high producing levels. And he's worked with a team that is one of the highest producing teams in Columbus. And so I'm really excited to have him. Thank you for joining with us, John. No, thank you for having me. So John, if you could um, tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got into real estate. Yeah. Um, what led you to be in real estate at all? Yeah, so for me, um, you know, I've been licensed 10 years and selling for 10 years now. And it all started back when I was graduating college. I came to Ohio State, um, originally went for accounting, uh, came upon calculus and I failed calculus and when I failed calculus I just made a decision of like okay maybe maybe this isn't what I want um, so I switched to sports management and I always said Ohio State sports management the degree you know you have two tracks basically one to go be a gym teacher one to go into you know the sports world selling most likely your first job is gonna be selling season tickets um, and at the time I didn't feel that I felt my, like my degree was worth more than me starting somewhere, whether it was here in Columbus or somewhere in a small town selling season tickets for a single A baseball team or whatever. And, um, you know, I didn't want to go and work 60 to 80 hours a week, barely making any money. Mm -hmm. So HGT, there's a lot of things that happened at that time, but HGTV was becoming popular with the flipping shows. Uh, growing up, my parents always bought older homes and we always worked on them, we always fixed them up. It wasn't necessary to flip them to make money, but you know, I kind of had some of that experience and kind of liked you know, transforming a room or a house or whatever. So I was like, hey, if you know, I'm gonna sell real estate, I wanna learn flipping, um, I might as well get into real estate and learn the sales side of, of how real estate works. Now I have no sales experience, no real estate experience, nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I did a Google search and I just found random people, random real estate agents, well, whoever popped up on that first sheet of Google, mm -hmm. um, I just started sending them emails. And one of them was Tracy Chambers, okay. who was the... Uh, team leader for Keller Williams Consultants. She's the only one that responded back in Dublin. to me. Yep, in Dublin. Uh, she's the only one that responded back to me. She's the only person I met with. And I'm, so I sat down with Tracy and she's like, hey, I got a, a young guy who is looking to build a team. I think you guys would get along. And uh, that person is my mentor and my team lead still, Ryan Reilly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I met with him uh, three weeks after graduating college. I, I started with him and I, went in to Hondros to get my, my uh, license. And you know he brought me in underneath him as his admin at first, allowed me to work Monday through, I think we worked Monday through Friday, like you know 30 hours a week if that, uh, just to help me pay some of my bills. And then I did the classes on the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, and he really took me under his wing and um, you know you can say the rest is history, but you know I've been with Ryan since day one of my career mm -hmm. and he's really, um, he's really guided me on, on, you know, how to not just think about real estate, but think of real estate as a business, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, we were just talking offline, you know, off camera here about, you know, if, if, if my business relies on me a hundred percent of the time in all aspects, that's not a business, that's a job, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, how can we create an actual business 
And that's where like most people in our industry, they're not taught that. They're not taught how to run a business. Mm -hmm. They're not even taught how to go and sell real estate. You know, we all get our, our classes, we pass the test and it's like, figure it out, <laughs> you know, good luck. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've been very blessed, um, you know, blessed that Tracy responded to me because if it wasn't for her, you know, I would never, I never would have met Ryan mm -hmm. and blessed that Ryan's been in my life and has taken me under his wing and, and has really shown me invested time, not just time, but money, you know, everything mm -hmm. um, to what I needed to get to this point. And, you know, now one of my passions is, is giving that back to others. Mm -hmm. Do you think, and before we kind of get too far into yeah. the um, different advice for agents, I wanted to ask when you were starting out with Ryan, how far ahead was he? Was he also not too far into the career or? No, so, you know, it's funny, I'm 32. Um, when I started with Ryan, he was 32 or 33. So now I'm thinking like, oh man, could I bring in someone underneath me you know, as a solo agent at the time, he was a solo agent. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he tried to build a couple teams before me. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he was just doing it on his own. He had recently connected with a uh, bank. Uh, that was when REOs and stuff were the foreclosures and short sales were still happening. And he, and he connected with a bank that had a hundred and when I, when I joined him, I think there was about 120 foreclosures that he, that the bank needed to sell. And Ryan was in charge of managing those properties. They had tenants in them. So collecting the rents, and then we would sell off those foreclosures. And I think it ended up, let's see, I joined Ryan in 2011. I wanna say by 2013, maybe, was when we finally got out of getting rid of the foreclosures. I could be wrong on the 2014-ish, but um, I wouldn't say he was you know, way ahead, but he had been licensed at that point for eight nine years mm -hmm. and he was just kind of doing it on his own you know mm -hmm. trying different teams you know trying to build team different spots uh, but you know the one thing that that we did was when that market was foreclosures and short sales and all that we we dove in we, we you know everyone else was you know you don't want to do foreclosures you don't make a lot of money i mean we were selling houses for fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars <laughs> you know so but it allowed me to understand that in any market if if you're willing to pivot mm -hmm. And if you're willing to do whatever it takes to, to bring in clients and to bring in money for your business, then you can survive anything. So it sounds like you caught him right before, he was, was like an above average agent and you caught him right before when he went to being a high producing team. Yeah. What yep. do you think would be one thing that helps Ryan stand out, um, that team, and since you were part of it from a fairly early stage, what do you think would be one thing that helps them stand out to be one of the highest producing teams? It's funny, it's funny you ask this because as I'm coaching agents and, and agents that want to build teams, this is the common thing, implementation and execution. That's it. So I've had this conversation with a couple different people in the last month, month and a half. If you actually look at what, what the Columbus House team, what we executed on when I, when I joined Ryan, was we executed on implementing internet leads as one of our main business pillars we executed on bringing in real estate agents and getting them into our systems and helping them go from zero transactions to whatever their goal was right some agents don't want to go out and, and make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars but by per, by putting systems in place we could bring someone in from from either a brand new person or someone from a different company plug them into the way we do business and get their and get their business going mm -hmm. and we focused on buyers we didn't go out and try to get a ton of listings we focused on the buy side mm -hmm. we own and then buyer consultations so like buyer consultations and buy side like i lumped those into so we executed on leads we executed on agents and getting their business up and running mm -hmm. and we executed on attracting buyer clients mm -hmm. And, and, and turning those buyer clients into raving fans, mm -hmm. repeat clients, that's it. So when you talk about top performing agents, most of them only execute on one, two, maybe three things. Mm -hmm. They're not executing on 10, 15 different things. Mm -hmm. They're executing on a couple things that, that produce the, the majority of their business. It's kind of like the 80-20 rule. So right? it's like a two or three very specific 
um, parts of their business that you have systems to do it well, like a rinse and repeat kind of yep. strategy yep. Um, and do it over and over again at scale. Yep. So for us, the mindset was how can we turn the Columbus house team into a franchise? What systems do we need? What tools do we need? And, and who are the people that we need to run it? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, that way, when you plug someone new into it, they already know how everything operates. We're not reinventing it every time someone comes in, mm -hmm. right? It's the same thing for every agent as they joined our team. Mm -hmm. But but you got to get the systems dialed in, mm -hmm. right? And then you know executing on those systems. So when you said bringing in a new agent, so assume a new agent comes in to mm -hmm. the Columbus House team or even to you, um, and maybe let's say they've been trying real estate and it's not been working out, or it's maybe it's another agent that's been doing it for a couple of years and they're doing okay, but they want to do even better. Sure. What is the first thing you're going to tell them to improve on or to do most of the time? Get in and be around as much real estate as possible. See, like w what I found over the last 10 years in, in helping agents um, build the momentum to get their business going is they're... They need to be in and doing and thinking real estate as much as possible. So what's great about our industry is time flexibility, right, within our day. The bad thing about our industry is time and flexibility, you know, within our day. I could take to last week I was in Las Vegas. Didn't really do any real estate, didn't have any coaching calls. It doesn't affect me last week or this week. Mm -hmm. It's going to affect me three months from now. Mm -hmm. See, when you work a nine to five, if you miss a week, guess what? Your paycheck next week's short. It's lower than what you're used to. Mm -hmm. In real estate, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. It's, oh, I can take today off. No big deal. You know, I'll just make up for it tomorrow. And then tomorrow, uh, I woke up a little bit later. No big deal. Right? I'll just make up for it. And then you never make up for it. Well, the problem is, is we don't see those results for three months down the road. Mm -hmm. So agents are like, oh yeah, I got complete flexibility. I can do whatever I want. Yes, that's part of it. But if you do that so often, you're not gonna have the results of helping clients and, and closing mm -hmm. deals. So for me, when an agent comes to our team, it's, hey, I'm gonna get you calling leads, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't teach the contracts until they get to the point of writing a contract. Mm -hmm. I need you to get calling leads to get you comfortable with real estate conversations, right? Language, all of those things. You're gonna be shadowing agents on our team, whether that's showings, listing appointments, open houses, mm -hmm. and that's all we're focusing on. I'm gonna get you in and doing as much real estate as, as possible. Mm -hmm. And the agents that, that do that and go all in typically have the faster success. Mm -hmm. The agents that you'll see like once or twice a week or once a week, they're gonna be slow because they're not thinking real estate all the time. Mm -hmm. My goal is I want you thinking real estate even when you're at home or even when you're at your other job, right? Oh crap, I gotta call so-and-so or I got a showing tonight or I gotta shadow so-and-so you know, on this listing appointment or I got an open house this weekend mm -hmm. or I got a buyer's consultation or I gotta watch this video. Right, because when it's top of mind and you're doing it, you're going to be more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Right, the more comfortable you are, the more confident you are, and the more confident you are, then you'll do it over and over and over again. So, part of like being around uh, real estate conversations a lot, that's going to be, I guess, a big part of lead generation. And on that topic, what do you think is the biggest factor when it comes to being efficient and well at generating new leads? I think the biggest thing that agents um, struggle with is they think they have to do it all right like oh I gotta go do mailers or oh I gotta go do open houses or oh I gotta generate internet leads or you know I gotta go door knocking um, you know for me it's pick two or three business pillars that you want to do your sphere of influence has to be one right um, personally I think internet leads needs to be two mm -hmm. right because you need some and we can get into it but you need some predict predictability and, and um, uh, it needs to be duplicatable uh, and then the third one can be you know what what do you what is your personality and what do you enjoy doing mm -hmm. so uh, for me I built my business only on boomtown leads in the beginning because I'm not from here I was 22. The friends I did have, we weren't buying houses, right? So for me, 
internet leads was a way for me to build my business. Mm -hmm. And then as I did that year one, year two, year three, then I started getting referrals and then past clients. And now my business is mostly sphere of influence, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, your sphere of influence needs to be one and there's ways that you can, you know, stay top of mind without always, you know, what I say, puking real estate on them. Um, <laughs> internet leads needs to be, I think, another component. And then the third one needs to be like, what do you enjoy doing? Some people enjoy meeting strangers, go to networking events, right? How can you be in front of as many people that are thinking real estate uh, so you can have those conversations, mm -hmm. open houses, right? Seminars, buyer seminars, seller seminars, you know, put yourself in that position. Me, you can't catch me at, an, at a networking event. It's mm -hmm. not my personality. It's not who I am, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm not good at meeting strangers and, and just starting up a, a conversation like that. Mm -hmm. But internet leads, you get me there all day, right? But most people want to try to do, do everything. The whole point is, is if you enjoy it, you'll do it consistently. Mm -hmm. Anything in real estate works. There's so many different ways to generate business and clients in, in our industry. The problem is, is we're not consistent at it because we don't either we don't like it or we're not comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. and I'm not saying internet leads is for everyone, right? But you know, you can go and make a ton of money and, and find clients doing open houses every weekend. It will work for some and it won't work for others. Mm -hmm. Be true to who you are and your personality. Um, and then it's just finding those activities to put in place to mm -hmm. be consistent with it. Is there anything you, th you see in agents consistently that they do wrong in lead generation? I, you mentioned some things they should do and obviously not doing that would be one of them. Yeah, they don't, they don't understand, they don't understand lead sources and the sales cycle based off of the lead source. So they don't give that lead source enough runtime to actually see uh, business come from it. For example, internet leads. On average, it takes six to 12 months to convert, right? So if someone joins my website today, on average, six to 12 months before they close. Some will close sooner, some will close longer. Mm -hmm. We have an $850,000 listing. It should be closing this month. That lead, originally came into our Boomtown account nine years ago wow. as a Craigslist lead. For, and I looked this up because it's, it's crazy. From a Craigslist lead that we posted about a foreclosure in Whitehall nine years ago, the guy owns a local, a local business here. He didn't start buying houses from our team until about th three to four years ago. Mm -hmm. And he's bought, I think, four through us and this last one he bought was a flip bought for 200 <clears throat> list you know completely did the whole thing eight hundred thousand dollar listing right mm -hmm. most agents don't have the patience right so when when ryan and i think about doing a new lead source uh, trying to attract a business we give everything a minimum of six months mm -hmm. we're not judging this until we've done it for six months okay most agents don't give it enough run time to see the momentum, and it's not even sales, momentum, right? Okay, six, I'm gonna try realtor.com leads. We're gonna give it six months. I don't need sales necessarily in the first six months, but do I have active buyers that I'm actually out looking, talking to? And if that answer is yes, then cool, I know I'm gonna have, I'm just gonna keep building on that momentum. Ryan has never turned off our internet leads one time, one month. They've never been shut off. We've been running leads since I joined him in March of 2011. We started Boomtown, I think around November, December of 2011. Mm -hmm. We have never shut our leads off, ever. We may have slowed them down, right, or ramped them up, mm -hmm. but they've never turned off. So like when agents are trying new things, they're not understanding the sales cycle behind it. Mm -hmm. I know if I go do an internet lead, I need to give it six to 12 months before I can really judge it. Mailers, you know, sending out to a neighborhood typically will take a year and a half, two years to start to see traction. So then it's, do you have the patience and then do you have the capital mm -hmm. to let that ride? Same thing with like open houses, right? Like you may go do an open house and you may get no one through. We'll go do a second open house, then go do a third and then go do a fourth. And then if you start doing those activities over a three, six, nine month window, mm -hmm. you're going to start seeing law of averages. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So if I'm doing, you know, four open houses a month and on average I'm bringing in 50 people and on average I'm getting one client a month. Well, there's your math. Now, then the question is, how can I scale this? Mm -hmm. How can I do eight open houses, bring in a hundred different, you know, a hundred people and get two clients a month? And I'm just making up those numbers, Mm -hmm. right? But that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Because then once you get to the point in your business where it's all business, my coach always tells me, business is just math. And when you can remove the drama, the emotion behind the math, Mm -hmm. then the question is, how can I scale? How can I do... 12 open houses a month if that's your if that's your thing right how can i do 12 open houses a month so or how can i bring in more people maybe i only have to do four open houses a month but how can i bring in a hundred people on the four instead mm-hmm. of 50 people on the four i have a question um i guess the one follow-up question with what you mentioned earlier if there is such a lead time of maybe six nine months three years and if you're meeting with hundreds of people throughout the year um, all at different stages of that. Yep. What is the best way? Because I feel like, and I can imagine for any business, especially in real estate, there could be a person that could buy a year down the road, but if you forgot about them yep. or you, I don't know, they went through the cracks and you forgot to follow up with them, um, how do you make sure that you keep track of all those people? That's a lot of moving parts without going crazy. <laughs> yeah, you need a CRM. You know, obviously the biggest thing is a CRM to stay in front of your, your database. But then I break them down into really three different Three different main categories, top 100. For a lead to be put in my top 100 category, they have to tell me that they're buying or selling in the next 12 to 18 months. What's top 100, like top 100 leads or? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's just kind of something that our team did, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so for example, if if, if I was managing you as an agent on our team and I saw that you had 80 people tagged top 100, that tells me that you spoke with 80 people that said at one point they're looking to buy or sell in the next 12 to 18 months. Mm-hmm. Out of those 80 people, you should have sales coming in because you should be staying in front of those 80 people, right? Um, so for me, it was always top 100, anyone who was looking to buy or sell in the next 12 to 18 months. And then when they're in the top 100 category, I would break those down into the seasons. So like right now, um, you know, I would consider this fall of 2021. Um, then I would do winter of 2022, spring of 2022, summer of 2022, fall of 2022. Mm-hmm. So if you told me, hey, my lease is up next September, I would put you top 100 fall 2022, right? Mm-hmm. Now, those people are going to slide in between seasons. So I have to stay in front of them. I just can't wait till the fall time. Mm-hmm. That might be too late because I've got to reach out to be in the summer. Right. But, but they, so they may slide from season to season, right? They may, chances are they're not going from the fall to the spring or from the fall to the winter, right? Um, but they may go from fall to summer or fall of 2022 to winter of 2023. So then I'm able to look, okay, I got 10 people that told me winter of 2022. I have 15 people already lined up for the spring of 2022 that have told me that they're, this is when they're looking to buy or sell. Okay, I got five people in the summer so far, and I got maybe two people in the, in the fall. Well, how can I add more to those buckets? That's my whole goal with prospecting and bringing in leads. Mm-hmm. And then the third category is hot. Hot is anyone that's looking to buy or sell in the next three to four months. Those are people that I should be either actively start showing or I need to be having meetings with consultations. Mm-hmm. What is, just so people have the expectation, I've, under, I've heard that in a given market, only like five or 8% are willing to buy now. And most of them are like in that top 100 as yes. you described. Yep. What is the expectation? Like even in Columbus in that percentage wise, like should, what, should you, what should your focus be on? Should you be despairing if you only have like 5% hot leads? No, I mean, I never focused on that. For me, it was always how many is my top 100? Because if I have 100 people in my top 100, well, I should have sales coming from that. Mm-hmm. Out of that top 100, some are gonna decide not to buy. Some are gonna decide not to sell. Some are gonna decide to continue renting. Some are gonna use a different agent. Some are just gonna disappear, right? And you'll just lose contact and some will slip through the cracks and some will use you, right? Mm-hmm. My job is to be in front of them as much as possible, 
remind them who I am. So I that if they don't use you, it's not your fault. Right. It's always my fault. It's never the lead's fault. Mm -hmm. It's John's fault if I didn't stay in front of them, if I didn't get them to sit down with me, or if they didn't uh, remember that I've been emailing them for 12 months properties and they went and used a different agent. Mm -hmm. Right? It's my fault because I didn't follow up enough and or I didn't catch their attention for them to remember me when they w were ready to buy. I always tell, I always tell clients and, and our agents, like we don't care when someone buys or sells. We just need to be the person that's in front of them when they do. I don't, like the lead that we have now, I didn't care that he didn't buy for five years. He kept coming back to my website because I kept sending him properties. Mm -hmm. Now, since he's bought four, five, six houses, whatever the number is, mm -hmm. right? But it took him four or five years to get there. Mm -hmm. um, but so from my mindset, it's always, I don't care when someone buys or sells, I just need to be the agent that's in front of them when they are ready. So for me, prospecting is getting them into my top 100, then putting them into the right season, and then moving them to the hot category. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is, um, just quickly, what are the best CRMs for agents to do this well? Best CRM is any CRM that you're gonna use. There's no, I mean, like every CRM has different bells and whistles and things like that. We use Boomtown. The reason, Boomtown is one of the more expensive ones, and the reason why we haven't switched from them is because we're so comfortable with it. Right, I can bring a new agent in and I can teach them and you know, I've been using it for 10 years now. Um, but all, all CRMs work. You just have to make sure you're using it consistently. There's CRMs that we've tried that I just didn't like. You know, some of the features, the flow, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that they didn't work, it just didn't work for me. I mean, a paper and pencil would work too. Paper and pencil works, right? Like any CRM, it's, it's how, the question is, what are the best tools to, like I always say Boomtown is, the number one feature on Boomtown is the search. We need to get every single lead on a home search because from there I can see exactly what they're looking at, what they like, what they, have they calculated a loan on, have they printed a flyer, have they emailed it to someone. Mm -hmm. I can see when they come back to the website, right? But if I'm not in my database, if I'm not in Boomtown, it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. right? An agent needs to be in their CRM every single day, multiple times a day. Most won't do that. Before we move on to the next category of kind of management, and I wanted to ask, um, it seems like for lead gen, the internet leads are some of the more, I don't know, mysterious ways of getting clients. It may be more confusing to people. What are some good tips you have on getting internet leads and how to kind of, once they've either filled out a form or whatever it may have been to kind of get in front of them that first contact? I think internet leads get a bad rap because people don't understand, right? Like. You can't tell me internet leads don't work. That's how we built the Columbus House team, right? You may say internet leads are garbage, but when you actually understand that an internet lead converts at 1%, so for every 100 leads, one will be good. Now the question is, how many clients do I want? And then how can I scale that? Or do I wanna put in that much effort to find that one person? If I told you, hey, Tim, there's gold in your backyard, you're probably gonna go and dig for it, right? But when I say, hey, there's, a, there's a, a lead in your database that's possibly worth six, nine, twelve, fifteen thousand $15,000 in commission, and all you have to do is just call these leads, agents don't do it, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, they want the instant gratification, right? They want the referral, and we all want the referrals, mm -hmm. right? That's the best, form of, of business we can do. But when I can say, hey Tim, every single month if you generate 100 leads and you're gonna have one client, your job's just to call through those leads and find that one person, then you can start being, your business can start being predictable. Mm -hmm. It's like um, if that backyard is the database and that gold uh, is the commission, then your shovel and pickaxe would be- Your phone. Your phone <laughs> consistency of using that CRM to like sift through all those leads. Exactly, and then the question is, do you wanna put in the effort to do it? Mm -hmm. And then I think the, the top teams are the ones that can automate it or, or systematize and have someone else do it consistently sure. so that it's not falling through the cracks. Exactly. It's like you even get sick, you go on a trip to Las Vegas or whatever it may be. Yep. So And leads are always coming in, right? But but back to the point, 1%, right? When, when I said business is just math, I know I have to generate 100 leads for one client. Now, I don't know if that client's gonna buy in three months, 12 months, five, five years. 
But when you take out the drama, my coach calls it the drama, the emotion behind 99 no's or people saying, hanging up on you, leave me alone, not looking, not answering, whatever, to find that one. When you take out the drama, the mm -hmm. emotion behind it, then it's just a game. It's how many leads can I generate to get more clients? Mm -hmm. So kind of moving on, there's that time of you've generated those leads and you're following up with them. Um, can you talk to the point of that middle portion of like the fulfillment of the service? Because every business, including a, or the agent's life, has the fulfillment side of things. What are some things you see agents doing wrong um, consistently that you'd say is a big factor? As far as the service to the client or yeah, like just... A, just like giving a... Because um, essentially you're selling a service. The, sure. The, the experience of it. How do you make... Is that a big part of being an agent? Because the service will be what brings them back. Sure. Yeah, I think my mindset it was always how can I turn this lead into a client and this client into a friend? So by the end of the transaction, I want them to be my friend. Because if they're your friend, they're gonna refer you friends, family, coworkers, whoever. Mm -hmm. um, we, we use raving fans is the term. You know, How can I turn them into a raving fan? Um, someone that's going to speak highly of you. Um, and a lot of it's like just making sure we're doing things in the right steps, the right order, and creating the uh, authority figure and trust with that person, right? So uh, if you're just a lead on my, in my database, you don't know me, right? You're just, I'm just some person that's sending you properties, right? Mm -hmm. Now I have to build the rapport by the follow-up and all of that, the trust by staying in front of them. And then when, when you're ready to start looking, right? Now you're gonna see how I interact. Am I on time, right? Do I show up early? You know, am I giving you the uh, service as far as making sure um, you know, I'm walking you through the house and advising you. I think one of the one of the things that agents don't do a lot of is is buyer consultations. You know, they're afraid to stop someone from looking in order to sit down with them and go over exactly programs and services that you offer a client. Mm -hmm. Here's the process it's going to take for you to buy a home. Here's some of the things we're going to see and terminology we're going to talk about as we go through this home buying process. Mm -hmm. You know, that hour to hour and a half meeting with that potential buyer can be a huge difference in a, in a lot of things for you. Even and your building client. the loyalty for a buyer. The loyalty, like, hey, you know, I want to make sure that you know that earnest money is this, and typically it's this amount, and it's going to cost you X amount to pay for your home warrant, or sorry, your home inspection. Oh, and you're going to have a, an appraisal to pay for. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's on top of any closing costs and your down payment, mm -hmm. right? So let's. And then when you start throwing in what you provide them as a client, right? Do you have a moving truck or a trailer? You know, do you provide, you know, an attorney, you know, a real estate attorney for the future? Or do you have a partnership with the CPA? You know, are you willing to give them, like for us, like, you know, we do things like, um, like we have a power washer any of our clients can use. We have an air compressor that our clients can use. We have a moving trailer that they can use. You know, are you really articulating even the small things you know, are you really articulating the small things to show why you're different than the next agent and mm -hmm. why it's a benefit for that, that client to work with you instead of someone else? Mm -hmm. What do you think right now is one of the biggest things that could be a value added? Because there's so many little things you can do. Do you have things that you saw? Because I know you're in connection with even agents through other markets. Do you know of any interesting things that agents do to bring extra value to their clients that you haven't really seen. Yeah, them. I mean, you know, bringing value is the, the biggest thing. I mean, I think for me, it's just making sure we're executing on service and, and being the expert, right? Like, mm -hmm. especially in this market when you got multiple offers, you know, are you calling the listing agent ahead of time and saying, hey, you know, obviously I know that your sellers want the best price, but are there any other terms or anything else that, that they want to see in an offer to that would win, right? You know, just getting those, that's a 15, 10 minute, 15 minute conversation. But if you can deliver the seller every single term that they want, and then I'm doing my job for my client. Now it's up to my client to decide if they want to do those things, right? Because they may say yes to this, yes to this, yes to this, no to that. Uh, but that's where then where I come in as far as negotiations, you know, mm -hmm. making sure, hey, is this one thing that we say no to a deal breaker, right? Having this, that communication up front mm -hmm. with, that, with that listing agent. Because ultimately my job is to make sure I 
I put my client in the best possible position to succeed when they find the home that they want. Mm -hmm. And if I don't do some of the things up front, the buyer's consultation, getting them pre-approved, right? Making sure they understand what earnest money is, making sure they understand what an appraisal is and an appraisal gap and, and you know, what does that look like, mm -hmm. right? Like I just won a deal, you know, our terms were pretty close, but we had earnest money, the other buyer didn't. Something like earnest money that doesn't necessarily mean a ton in a deal, but it was one factor that separated it, mm -hmm. right? Well, that other client and agent missed out because maybe they didn't put a $500 earnest money deposit down mm -hmm. that they'd get back at closing. Mm -hmm. That's all. I mean, it's basically just being a professional and not assuming that just because you're, you have a license that I think it's just, you know, I tell agents all the time. I, I personally view myself on the same tier as a doctor and as an attorney. And you know, you don't walk it. You don't tell your attorney to meet you at Starbucks. Your attorney says, no, you're going to come to my office and here's how we do things. Right. And I want to make sure you're educated on this. The doctor's office, right? You're going to them most of the time. You're going to them and there's, you're going to meet certain people before you even meet with the doctor. Mm -hmm. You're going to meet with the receptionist. Then you're going to meet with the nurse. And then the doctor's is going to come in, talk to you for five, 10 minutes, right? And, and tell you what you need. That's kind of how I view real estate, right? Like, hey, you're going to meet with me. We're going to go over this process and then you're going to get pre-approved, mm -hmm. right? And you're going to talk to the lender. We're going to make sure that's squared away. And then we're going to start looking at homes. I think another interesting and val very valuable point is that once you do these buyer consultations and you get all the like dominoes lined up in a way, it even sets you up for success because there are some things that they might not be doing correctly that kind of cause you to fail. And it's not even your fault, but it makes you look bad either way. Yep. And so you kind of set yourself up for maximum success. Yep. Uh, Brian Smith, he's a, he's a local lender. Um, he, he was a client of mine and he coaches agents and lenders too. And you know, he told me one thing that, I mean, this was probably four years ago. Um, he had a saying that, that what begins well ends well. If we do everything right in the beginning, typically we're not going to have any issues right at closing. Mm -hmm. So my job is to make sure, and I tell my clients this, my job is to make sure I put you on the path to success. The worst thing I can do is show you a house that you don't qualify for that you absolutely fall in love with. Or the worst thing I can do is get you into contract and three days before closing, something happens because of financing or whatever. And you've already told your apartment that you're moving out and now you can't buy the house and now you're totally homeless, right? That is the worst thing I can do for you as your agent. So sometimes we need to take a step back to take five steps forward. Mm -hmm. So it may be my job to say, hey, we're, we need to stop. We need to, we need to look at this. We need to put your, put a plan in place for you to be successful. So all these things sound in theory, very practical. And I mean, they all make sense, but I imagine in the real world agents obviously don't do a lot of these things. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge or a problem that prevents them from doing that? Anyone that knows me, um, the, I think our industry is broken. The real estate industry as a whole is broken in the sense of we all get our license and they just, here you go, right? Um, and it doesn't matter the brokerage. Every brokerage has training. You know, every brokerage at this point typically has a, a quote unquote mentorship program, right? Um, but what agents need, in my opinion, what agents need is more one-on-one -on -one training. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take you know, an hour out of my day every, every week to make sure that I'm checking in on you to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's, hey, you're gonna go with me on a showing, hey, we're gonna talk about the listing paperwork, hey, we're gonna make phone calls together. Um, and I think like most brokerages, right, we all have training, but it's one-to-many. And the people that thrive in the one-to-many are probably going to thrive in real estate anyways, right? Like they're mm -hmm. just the go-getters, the doers, the whatever. You find someone like myself, like I tell everyone this, if it wasn't for Ryan, I would not be in real estate. Mm -hmm. I'm not that go-getter. I'm not that person that's going to figure it out on my own. I needed someone to say, hey, John, this is what we're doing. These are the leads you're going to call through here. Oh, hey, today I'm going to go... Um, you know, collect rent from tenants. You're riding with me. Hey, I'm going on this listing appointment. You're coming with me. Most people need that, mm -hmm. but most brokerages, because you have to scale with numbers, offer only the one to many. Mm 
Mm -hmm. They don't do a one-on-one weekly call with their agents every single week. Sometimes it's impossible, right? Mm -hmm. Especially at bigger brokerages. And I think that's the biggest thing is like, if we can get to the point where you almost create like an apprenticeship, like, hey, you're you're stuck to John and you're following him for three months, right? Like you may do showings for him. You may, you know, have to write up a contract. You may have to be his assistant, essentially. Um, and I think if we went more that route, we'd our, our failure rate would change. Mm-hmm. Our failure rate's 80, like 87% by the end of year two. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't even have to be that way. So real estate's not complicated, right? Like we, we like to make it harder than what it is. Mm-hmm. Would you say a factor of it is personal discipline? Uh, personal discipline. See, a lot of people, in my, I believe a lot of people get into the business because they either want more money or they want more time. Or they want to get out of a career that they hate. Typically because they want more time or more money. Mm-hmm. right? But when you get into real estate, if you actually make more money, you typically have less time. Because you're busy, you're out showing, doing all, you know, with clients. Or if you have more time... You're typically not selling real estate. Now you can have both, but that's where you build a team, mm-hmm. and then you got to scale, mm-hmm. right? Like Ryan, you know, he has both, but in the beginning, he worked, right? He didn't have a hundred percent of his time. Then he went and found well, we found each other, right? And then I took all of his buyers, so I just took half of his time. You know, he he gained more time by giving me buyers, mm-hmm. and then. It's, Okay, let's go get a second agent, a third agent, a fourth. And some people don't want that. I wanted to expand on a point you mentioned, which is if you want to have more time and more money in real estate, you're going to have to build a team and to scale. Um, I imagine some agents either don't get to that level where they want to get a team or they just don't want to be at that level. Sure. And I wonder, is are there any tools they can use that could help them? I guess even like a CRM where they, it could help them manage all those moving parts that sifting through leads, managing their current um, transactions, and then the referral side of things, something to manage all that together. I don't know if you'll, you'll, I don't know if you'll ever be able to be a one-man show and, and do that. Really? Um, I think there's, now when I say team, it doesn't have to be real estate agents, right? Like we're, we've implemented a VA, a virtual assistant in the last month and a half. Um, you know, they're helping us go through the leads, right? Um, but, you know, if you're still going to be doing the showings and the listings and, you know, working with clients, you, there, there becomes a point where you're tapped out. Mm-hmm. You're either going to be tapped out or you're going to be burned out, right? It's just a matter of time. Um, and I'm not saying a team's for everyone, but then the question is, do I want to be on this grind every single day of my life? Mm-hmm. And that's for every agent to decide, right? Like for me, I never wanted to go and sell 50 houses a year. Mm-hmm. Personally, I never wanted to sell that. I had a certain goal, a certain lifestyle that I wanted to live, and that was I was comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for Ryan, he built a team because he wanted complete freedom of his time, right? Well, how do you do that? You, you go out and you get... You replace yourself uh, with systems uh, and people? Other people to, to, to do it for you, right? Mm-hmm. And, and for him, you know, he's taken less of a split than if he were to go and sell 60 houses himself, mm-hmm. but he has the time and the freedom and the flexibility that he wants. Mm-hmm. I wanted to touch on, there's so many other things we could talk about. I, well, yeah, we're I probably, could talk forever. <laughs> we'll probably need like a part two and three. I did want to, personally, I've talked with many agents over the years and it's kind of funny besides them saying what their name is, they usually mention that they're, they get their business from referrals. Yep. And I've also, maybe, maybe you've met one or two, if any, that have had a system in place yep. to get referrals. What do you think is the best or most successful way to kind of cultivate those referrals? Would it be similar to those, or would it be the same exact thing as what you do with the leads? Or is there a yes. different approach? Yes, no, it's, it's all the same, right? You're, you're, it's how can I stay top of mind? That's it, right? So internet lead, you know, I gotta get them set up on the search and I gotta follow up, right? Stay in front of them. Uh, referral, past client, you know, SOI, whatever it may be. It's how can I engage with them on a, on a consistent basis to stay top of mind, not always puke real estate on them, Mm -hmm. but let them know that I'm a real estate agent, right? That's inviting them to to events. That's, you know, I tell agents this too, like even, you know, if I'm out showing a house, right? Check in to that city out showing houses tonight, right? Maybe I'm in Canal Winchester. Um, You know, maybe I'm at the office and I'm hitting the, the phones and I'm prospecting, right? 
make a post about how you're, you know, you're, you're hitting the phones and, and calling people about looking to buy or sell. You don't always have to put out those posts that say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for referrals. If you know anyone that's looking to buy or sell, please send them my way. Mm-hmm. That does work, but that can't be your only post. Mm-hmm. There's other ways as agents that we can stay top of mind in front of our sphere of influence. The other thing too, and this goes for any type of lead, how can I bring this person value right now? If I'm going to reach out to them, how can I bring them value? Mm-hmm. An internet lead, uh, Seth Sias, who who's on Jermaine's team, Jermaine Fox's team, who I coach. You know, when he got into the business, I told him, you know, these leads they don't care about you and I. They just we just need to give them what they want, and mm-hmm. what they want right now is they want to see property listings. Now, over time, as you build that rapport and they become clients, then they start to care about you. Mm-hmm. But in the beginning, they don't care about, like he, he, he'll tell you, we, I told him not, he, I saw the post and it was an ad with his picture and information and he was running a Facebook ad. Mm-hmm. I said, Seth, it's not going to work. No one cares about you, right? They want to see properties in Circleville. They want to mm-hmm. see properties in Grove City. That's the biggest way to get someone's attention, right? So if I'm an SOI or I'm, I'm connecting with my sphere of influence, um, you know, I was just telling an agent today on a coaching call, if it was me, and this is something that we're going to start doing next year, I would go through my own personal database, my friends, my family, whoever, whoever has a small business, mm-hmm. I'm going to reach out to them and I'm going to say, you know, Hey Tim, um, you know, I have a, a past client or a, a database of 500 people. Can I, can I highlight you? Connect you with someone. And this month's email to my database with your service. Mm-hmm. So let's just say springtime, right? In the springtime, everyone needs their, their or should be getting their AC serviced. I should be reaching out to an HVAC company. And, and if they're in my database already, this is even better, right? Reaching out to an HVAC company and say, hey, for my 500 past clients or my 500 people in my database, instead of you charging $150 for your AC service, would you charge them 99 bucks? And it's only for my past client database. Mm-hmm. Now guess what? That month mailer for, for April, hey guys, I got ABC HVAC company. Um, you know, they're actually a friend of mine or a past client or whoever, right? Uh, and for, for you exclusively, they're offering you to get your AC service for 99 bucks. For you as my client. Basically. For you as my client. And you feel like you're, I, th- I think it's the creating the indebted, they feel indebted to you now, which creates that loyalty. But you're actually bringing them value, Yeah. right? Like it's not, you know, you're actually bringing them value. And to the, to the small business owner, it's like, hey, if I could bring you an extra 20 people, right, to their database, right? Yeah, that they may take the hit up front, the $50 that they're going to lose. But now they have my client's phone number, name, address. And who knows, maybe in the future, if they do a good job with follow-up, they're going to get the furnace servicing. Maybe they're going to get any future repairs that may be needed. Mm-hmm. And maybe they're going to get a future replacement, mm-hmm. right? So that's the idea is how can I provide value to this person at this time mm-hmm. at this follow-up? And really understanding, you know, what is that? Mm-hmm. And that's just one way, right? Like I would send out, I would find 12 local small business owners, whether it's in my database or people that I know and trust, and how can I bring that to my own database and highlight one every single month? And it's a value add. One question. So when it comes to that kind of follow-up and creating that value add, whether for new leads or referral past clients, um, what's the best way to go about it? Is it to find some kind of software and um, that helps you automate that process? Or is it better to hire it out either to a VA or even a person? Or is it even possible to automate it and still be not and still be a value and not spammy. I think it comes down to making sure as real estate agents, we're having conversations with other agents and aligning aligning with people that are willing to help you grow. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's things that I take from conversations with different agents that they're doing that's working in their business and I'm just putting it into our business. Mm -hmm. As far as automating it, you know, that email that will maybe take you, I don't know, 10 minutes a month right? To actually type that out and then send it to everyone. Mm-hmm. Now it's going to take you time to build that relationship with the, the lender or the vendor, or whoever you're partnering up with on that monthly highlight, mm-hmm. right? Um, but what a great opportunity for you to go and meet the local business owner, mm-hmm. right? Talk to them. Hey, you know, 
I want to I want to help you grow your business. I have a database, and this is kind of what I'm thinking about doing. Are you cool with this? And if they say no, well, I guess you made the connection, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna go find someone else that's willing to say yes, mm -hmm. right? And then guess what? Now you can start creating your your past client vendor list. Now you can send that list out of all of the preferred people that you 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 know sign off on. Mm -hmm. Hey, here's my preferred roofer. Here's my preferred electrician. Here's my preferred HVAC. Here's my preferred flooring. Here's my, you know what I mean? Window guy. Um, here's my preferred uh, car detailer. Here's my preferred doctor. You know, whatever it is, my CPA. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, I think, I think it's just staying top of mind, providing value. Don't be spammy. You know, it's not, Hey, who's looking to buy or sell real estate. Um, and when you can do that on a consistent basis, be genuine, be authentic, mm -hmm. right? Social media is a great tool for that. That's something I've learned from Mike Doyle, you know, with coaching him over the last year. He uses social media as a tool. Mm -hmm. You know, he consumes it. Most people consume it, right? And they don't do anything with it. But Mike uses it as a tool as well. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And he's actually the one that let us use his office, yeah. his new office. Yeah. Um, to kind of wrap it up, what are some good tools in general and that could include even books or resources that you would recommend to agents to help them either stay new and up to date or even kind of grow. I'm a very basic person. So I think a lot of times we get caught up on the shiny objects, you know, the bells and whistles of, of this program, that software, whatever it is. Um, I think if you stick to the basics, then you'll be successful. And a lot of that is making sure you have a CRM to not just a CRM, but typically a CRM that has a search feature tied to it, an IDX feed tied to it, because that's going to allow you to, to follow the leads activity, mm -hmm. right? How many, how often are they coming back to the website? All of those things, focusing more on text messages first, reach outs, then phone calls, then emails. Mm -hmm. Um, getting into different conversations and, and aligning with agents that are doing more than what you're doing. So I, I believe that everyone should have a real estate coach. I believe that everyone should ha be a peer to someone else. So a coach will help you get to where they're going, right? Mm -hmm. Or where you want to get to. A peer is someone that is on the same path as you. You know, maybe you're doing 35 deals and they're doing 40, right? They'll, they'll help you get through the ups and the downs because you guys are going through it at the same time together. Mm -hmm. And then I also believe that everyone should be a coach. Everyone, there's someone that wants to get to where you're currently at. And by you coaching them to get to where you're currently at, it's gonna help you build communication skills. It's gonna help you learn faster. It's gonna help you dial in your own stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I believe, you know, like I'm big on Clubhouse, the social media app Clubhouse. Um, we do a room with real estate professionals Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Um, you know, it doesn't matter the industry as far as lender, home warranty, home inspector, or brokerage, real estate agents, doesn't matter. We just get together every, every morning and we have real conversations. You know, like today was, you know, work-life balance with kids and family. How, how can you go and, and sell real estate but still give the kids enough time, still give the wife enough time, still give the husband enough time. Like real conversations that we don't have at the office mm -hmm. or that you don't learn about at school. You know, like how can I reach out to my past clients, right? What happens if an agent leaves your team? Mm -hmm. You know, like what, 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 how can you get through that? What's that process? And there's agents at all different levels, brand new agents to, you know, big time teams. Mm -hmm. And when you find people that are willing to help you grow and help everyone grow, um, then it's just then it's just taking what's working for them and how can I tweak it and put it into my business. Mm -hmm. You know, the funny thing about Columbus is there's going to be over thirty some thousand sales this year. When you when you count new total new builds and FISBOs and all that, we're probably close to forty thousand, right? You know, our team will do about three hundred and fifty sixty transactions, maybe. That's not even 1% of the market, mm -hmm. not even 1%. So most likely I'm not going to compete with the majority of real estate agents on a, on a listing or on a buy side deal, right? So why am I afraid to share exactly what we did to grow our business with, with whoever? Mm -hmm. um, and when, and when you get around people like that, 
then it's then it's just unlimited because then then it just comes down to implementing it and executing mm -hmm. on it. Yeah, you can only do so much on your own. You only you can't think so highly of yourself that you'll figure everything. No out No one's your inventing own. anything. Yeah. Right. Like we're all just repurposing it and packaging it and putting it into our business. Any books that you recommend? Uh, books. Um, or are you not a book guy? No, I love reading books. Um, there's a couple that I've read this year that I, I really enjoyed. Uh, Work by Referral by Brian Buffini. Um, that was one that I read this year. That will probably be one that I read on a uh, yearly basis. There's a couple books that are, for me, like simple concepts mm -hmm. that a lot of us overlook. That was one of them. Work by Referral. Uh, the other one is Power of Consistency. I forget the author's name off the top of my head. Um, but again, <laughs> you know, the concept, you can't do the right things consistently and get the wrong results. Mm -hmm. That's basically what that book's about, <laughs> right? Like there's no way you can't do the right things consistently and get the wrong results. Mm -hmm. Um, so I like that one. Uh, the go giver is one that I read this year. We actually just had the author on our book club for, uh, on clubhouse and, <laughs> and, uh, you know, again you know being authentic being true to who you are mm -hmm. you know you're going to attract people that are similar to you right mm -hmm. like there's going to be times where and you'll know it as an agent right like you go and you're working with someone and it's just like man this is like pulling teeth because you guys aren't in alignment on things right you don't mm -hmm. see things the same way uh, but the idea is you know just be true to who you are be authentic and you're gonna you're gonna attract people um I'm trying to think of some of the other ones i read read this year uh, you know, I'm always big on like the 10x rule by Grant Cardone, um, the compound effect by Darren Hardy. Again, simple things, right, that we can just focus on. We mm -hmm. like to overcomplicate things. Mm -hmm. And the major league success book. Yeah, so, um, you know, Fast Track 120 mm -hmm. is, is a, I call, it's kind of weird. I call it a book, but it's really a guide, mm -hmm. right? You know, most agents don't focus on the income producing activities that we need to do on a daily basis to, to bring in the clients, mm -hmm. right? Cause if we can bring in clients or leads or whatever, we can bring in the income, mm -hmm. right? But we get distracted on, Oh, I got to become better at social media or I got to become good at Canva or I got to be this, I got to be that I got it. Right. And we don't focus on what we actually need to do. And that's where like, just focus on your income producing activities, prospecting, reaching out to your sphere of influence, right? Mm -hmm. Calling FISBOs for sale by owners if you wanna go after listings. Mm -hmm. When you actually, if you actually just think about it, as a real estate agent, if you just hyper-focus for three hours a day on income producing activities, you'll make well over six figures. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can do that three hours. Every day. You're, I'm talking 15 hours a week. There's no way you could do that with another full-time job if you really want to. hundred percent. And see, the most agents that, that, that I've been a part of that transitions from another career, the ones that hyper-focused right after their job and knocked out their income-producing activities, they got busy at night showing houses because they generated the clients, right? You know, but it's the people that don't focus on those income-producing activities. Um, that's when they're like, well, I don't have nothing going on. Okay, well, let's, let's look at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> We're not doing... We're not doing, you know, like, you know, like we were talking off, off camera about like social media posts and stuff. Mm -hmm. For me, it's never top of mind. You know what I mean? So like, why would I, why would I, I would rather pay someone to do it for me. Mm -hmm. Right. Why do I need to become good at that myself? Mm -hmm. You could outsource some things. Because it's not income producing. Right. In a way. It can. Not, it can be, but like, it, it's not, it's not, not worth it compared to like. There's a difference people. between a post right and then there's and then engagement mm -hmm. engagement is more income producing than just posting something mm -hmm. you need both right you need the marketing you need branding you need all of that but if the marketing and branding isn't bringing in a, any business then what's the point mm -hmm. right so like you know we talked about engagement comments on posts direct messages text message reach outs phone calls handwritten notes Right, and all of that's in Fast Track 120. Mm -hmm. You know, Fast Track 120 is a daily success guide. Focus on these income producing activities every single day for 120 days. Mm -hmm. and but it's to build the momentum, right? Because once you can get the momentum, it becomes a habit and then you start getting clients. And So it's basically a guide of how to be that, do those three hours of hyper-focused exactly. activities. Exactly, And where could people get them? Just FastTrack120.com. Mm -hmm. One, 
O-N-E, 2O.com. Awesome. I think um, it'll be a value to people. And I think even if they would just do what they've heard in this episode, it would, that alone would help them to get at least a little bit further than where they are with whatever they're doing right now. Yep. Um, so I really appreciate you joining, John. Um, I, I think it'll be useful to do another episode <laughs> later on because there's so much more. I know that yeah. I know you have a lot more to share yeah. that you didn't even get to. Um, but I really appreciate you coming over. And I think that anyone listening, uh, could, they could even reach out to you. Uh, what's the best place to do that? Yeah, just, you can reach out to me. Um, Facebook, John Harp, Instagram, I think it's DJ Harp. Uh, if you want to text me, my cell phone, 614-309-7925. Um, if you want to jump on a, on a free coaching call, uh, we can get that squared away as well. But yeah, I mean, for me, <clears throat> you know, doing things like this is, I got lucky in finding uh, Tracy and Ryan, right? And I know most people don't have that when they get started in this business. Um, so I'm blessed and I, I feel it's my, my duty and my obligation to, to be that Tracy and Ryan to other people, to be that Tracy and Ryan to other people, um, and to give back because, you know, what, like I said earlier, what we execute on, you know, we didn't invent it, right? We just, we just focused on two to three different things and we, that's all we did. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and real estate doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be hard. Mm -hmm. We just like to make it hard. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, John. Um, and for the listeners, we'll see you in the next episode. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome.